So awesome, thanks for joining us today. It's always fun when we get to do a training that people elect to come to. So thank you. Super fun that we're not forcing you to be here with us. Um, so um, hopefully you're in the right training, importance of skill building to support seamless transition to adulthood for individuals with autism. Pretty big hand, uh, mouthful. Um, I'm Lindy Mishler, um, and I have my colleague Heidi Arba today. Um, and we are with the um, Bureau of Supports for Autism and Special Populations. We just got a new name, and I am getting used to it. So I apologize if I have to actually read to you our name. Um, that is who we're with, formerly known as the Bureau of Autism, and we're part of the clinical team. So we're pretty excited to bring you this content today. Um, and hope it's a little bit of a twist for you in regards to what you're currently doing with transition. Um, so who are we? Um, like I said, you guys might have heard us referred to before as the Bureau of Autism Services up until two weeks ago. Um, and this is actually the first time that we were told we're allowed to present our new name to everybody. Um, so we are formally presenting ourselves as the Bureau of Supports for Autism and Special Populations. Um, and we're here to give you guys a little bit of a different perspective to transition as you currently know it. Um, to give you an idea of who we are, because typically um, people ask where I work and I say the Bureau of Autism Services and they say we didn't even know Pennsylvania had a Bureau of Autism. Um, I feel like this is echoing. Is it echoing? Is this a little better? A little better? Um, so who we are, um, we fall under the Office of Developmental Programs uh, and um, we're out of the Department of Human Services. So when we talk about transition, when we talk about IEPs, that kind of stuff is coming from the Department of Education and we're coming from the different perspective of the Department of Human Services. So um, our hope today is to really give you guys a little bit of a spin on what it is that you're already doing, on what it is that you already know, and um, show you some of the research and um, strategies that we take on to um, help our adults with transition and the things that we've found that have worked for them. So hopefully you guys are able to use that um, with, with the individuals that you're working with as well. <clears throat> okay, um, so I wanna start by talking about transition just to make sure that we're all on the same page because when we're talking about transition, um, Heidi and I come from a program that we support adults with autism in Pennsylvania. So we're at, within our bureau, we're the ones that regulate the state programs in Pennsylvania for adults with autism. Um, so we're not actively transitioning people as you guys know transition to be. Um, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, today we're gonna be talking about transition in the broad terms. And what I mean by that is, um, we're talking about it in the most basic sense. We're talking about it in terms of figuring out what it is that you wanna do, um, building those skills and resources necessary to do those things that you wanna do, and then going ahead and making it happen. So we're not necessarily, the strategies we're gonna to introduce to you today, they can be used in the adult world like we do, but it can also be used in, in the transition from childhood, school age, and on. So we're talking about lifelong transition today. <clears throat> um, because really in theory, everyone goes through this transition process, right? Um, whether that's in, in the way that you guys know from moving on from high school, um, people transition when they're moving out of their parents' homes, right? Um, we've gone through transitions where we're changing careers changing placement, so everybody, regardless of age, is really going through a transition process. Um, and the part that we wanna talk about is, as professionals, I'm not sure of the population that we're talking to today, so when we're talking as professionals, as family members, um, as caregivers, we wanna really encourage you guys to alter your minds when you think about transition. Um, because transition really is more than just documents. Um, that you get at a transition meeting. It's more than just the IEP, the information in the IEP. What I wanna do today is really challenge you to think of it, because that's really just step one. Um, 
I want to challenge you to think of it in terms of a process because this step two is what's going to make an individual grow, learn, move on to that next stage of their life. Um, and so the step two is what we're really gonna be concentrating on today. Um, and I, here's an acronym that we forgot to fix today, so I apologize, everybody. Um, the Bureau of Autism Services, you'll probably, I'm still not used to that name, so you'll probably hear me default to that throughout today's training. Um, our focus is on lifelong learning. That's what we do. I told you, I shared with you that we work with adults. So we take a focus on lifelong learning. Um, and really, this is what we, we, aim, we hang our hat on this. This is, this is what we believe um, at our bureau. So we believe in the capacity for all individuals and that as people become adults, um, more is expected of them to become contributing members of society, right? Just like any one of us. So. We want to make sure that we're really supporting that lifelong learning process. And I apologize, guys. We're used to having clickers. So um, this is distracting to me, but I need to keep clicking through here. Um, so when we're supporting this lifelong learning process, we need to remember that we need to be completing steps one and steps two. And this is where our, um, the Department of Education and Department of Human Services merge together. So hopefully I got a little bit of your buy-in or understanding in regards to this whole step two that we're gonna be walking through today. Um, before we dive into really explaining the strategies that we wanna to introduce to you and the different um, research that we've, we've grown to understand within our program, we wanna share a little bit about the why. Because taking a look at our current, current process of transition, and, and I will, Give the disclaimer that this is gonna be a little crude summary because this is not our world. This is your world. We, we work with the adults, but a crude summary for the sake of a conversation today um, is you know, transition planning starts school age, right? Your child's younger, the child's younger. You start to identify that you need to create a vision for their future, identify the steps and strategies that need to be in place to make that happen. And then somewhere along the line, you might have to do some assessments, right? Are these, does the child have the skills to make this vision happen? Um, is, it, is it in their wheelhouse, really, essentially? Um, but what ends up happening is the ultimate goal is to, of course, be like this, welcome to the rest of your life, right? Here's your IEP. We're gonna line up these goals for you and, and you're gonna tell us what you wanna do for the rest of your life. But what ends up happening when an individual comes to you and says that they want to be a Grammy award-winning singer-songwriter and you can't make that happen for them because they don't have the skills and abilities? Um, so we want to be able to make that happen for them, right? Um, but there's a lot of pressure that comes along with an individual so young that, that's trying to go through this transition process. So take all of that pressure and all of that confusion that these young adults are feeling preparing for this. And consider somebody with autism. So add in the general struggles that somebody with autism might be experiencing. Um, for some, when talking to some of the students, it might be really difficult to identify their desires and their interests and their goals. Um, that person might not be able to articulate what it is that they really want to be doing for the rest of their life. And some people with autism have difficulty considering and thinking of and understanding abstract concepts. So having a vision of what their future could be can be very, very difficult for them. Um, so what ends up happening is somebody with autism might be experiencing all of this overwhelming pressure that causes a collapse for them and makes transitioning very, very difficult to happen. Um, so in our world, before we started doing what we're gonna introduce you to today, transitioning for people with autism and for young adults with autism sometimes seem nearly impossible. Not for everybody, but for a lot of the individuals that we were working with. So what we want to do is talk to you about the things that we found to work for this population. Because um, there was a time that we had to sit back in our programs early on and think, 
how the heck are we going to make this possible for these people to be able to transition successfully? Um, and so this is what we want to be able to share with you today. But um, we're going to challenge your current way of thinking a little bit. Um, we're going to ask you to be a little flexible in what you know already, because we're going to ask you to think about when you start this transition process. And I'm thinking it's going to be a little bit different than what you know already. Um, we're going to introduce some new tools, some new strategies to you. And then we're also going to walk you through what these tools look like, how to use them, and what this transition process can look like from start to finish. So hopefully we get to challenge you guys a little bit and alter your way of thinking by the time that our session's done today. And um, of course, the first thing we want to start talking about is the when part of those challenges. So, um, yikes. This is why we need clickers. Um, Sorry, guys. Nope, it's not. Thank you, though. Thank you. Just pretend like I have one here. Um, OK, so going back to where we were, as we talked about, typically what? You guys tell me a transition starts to begin happening around ages 14, 16, something like that, right? Um, but something to think about is, Again, everybody's engaging in this transition process in literally every single part of our lives. We're still engaging in it. And so what we want to challenge you guys to start thinking about is starting transition earlier than that 14 to 16 age. Um, so why? OK, taking this little guy, for example. Um, when we look at transition with, with childhood, it could look something like this, right? From, from home to daycare, daycare to kindergarten, kindergarten to primary school. All of those are transitions, and they're pretty significant transitions for anybody who's been a parent or even a loved one of somebody going through these, right? Um, so what ends up happening as this little guy goes from being a baby in the home stage to being a young child in the primary school? What needs to happen for them to be able to, to transition successfully? They need to be skill building, right? They need to be building those skills, and they need to be <laughs> retaining the skills that they build. And this doesn't just start at 14. Something doesn't just click, and that has to start working then. It starts when they're babies, and it goes until we die, right? This is a lifelong process that's happening, because we're constantly learning new skills to be able to move up to whatever that next level is, right? Um, so in order to progress in life, we've got to be learning and retaining these, these skills. Um, so taking a look at this little guy again. So here's the little baby stage, right? What are some of the skills that they're gonna, he's going to need to move on maybe to that daycare stage? Um, maybe it's going to be the first time he's leaving mom and dad. He's going to have to learn coping skills to be able to do that, right? Um, maybe as he gets a little bit bigger, um, toddler age, he starts to um, interact more, have some play skills, more peer-to-peer -peer interaction happening, um, working on some motor and mobility skills, right? Um, next stage, after, you know, maybe he starts going on to, to school, um, Lit, there's more listening, following directions. Um, then we add in a little bit more complicated skills. We're, looking, we're expecting them to follow more complicated instructions, taking more of a focus on academic skills. So I think you guys can see the point. This is all skill building through every single phase that this child's going to be going through. So if that isn't complicated enough, again, I'm going to go back to somebody with autism. And, and I want to put the disclaimer out there. When we're describing somebody with autism, everybody knows not one person is alike, right? So these are just um, for the sake of ex giving our, our examples. Um, I want to make sure that's very, very clear. So let's take an example of somebody with autism. So if all those little things that every single person needs to learn in every different stage of their life isn't complicated enough, you take somebody with autism who might have difficulty with um, coping skills for maybe some sensory stimulation. We have a, we have a lot of people <laughs> who try to force people with autism to make eye contact. We, we just love that one, don't we? Um, minimizing self-stim behaviors, um, following multiple step instructions, 
learn how to interact with others, and then once they learn that, learn how to interact appropriately with people. Um, and then we're not even going to start talking about the people who are nonverbal and the skills that they need to learn. So somebody with autism can really be affected in a lot of different ways, especially when we're talking about the expectations when it comes to learning the primary and the secondary skills. This is a lot of stuff on somebody's plate to learn. And this is just the transition into primary school. So this is a lot of stuff that we're expecting on, the, on these young, young kids here to learn. So we struggle, we struggled when we were thinking about this way back when, um, when we were thinking about, okay, so we're expecting these young kids to deal with all these struggles and all these complications, and then somewhere along the line, maybe get wraparound services, some type of therapies to assist them. Um, and then we're gonna say, you know what, come into our office and we want you to map out what you're gonna be doing after you graduate, right? Mind blowing, right? Guys, it's not gonna happen. That's just not the way that you're gonna be able to help successfully transition somebody. It has to start earlier. We need to be identifying the skills to develop and to improve and to strengthen their abilities, right? And we need to begin working on skill building immediately from when they are babies. We cannot be waiting until they're 14 to 16 just to start the transition planning process. So by the time this guy gets into junior high, hopefully he has the skills that he's going to be able to need to really be able to transition successfully when he gets to that point. Um, and and this, this transition process has got to be something that he's gonna be thinking about for the rest of his life. I've learned skills that I didn't know last year. Um, I'm gonna learn skills next year that I didn't know this year. This is just part of living a life, right? So this is a lifelong process, and I think sometimes with the individuals that we support, we forget about that. And we think we just need to get them to step B, but we forget about all those other steps after that. It's gonna be lifelong, and it's something that we gotta constantly be doing with them. So we need to remember those next levels that we need to get somebody to. Um, so I hope that we're all on the same page in regards to the importance of why we need to start doing this earlier. Um, and I hope it, it challenges your way of thinking a little bit in terms of starting, the, starting this transition eight, phase out at ages 14 to 16. Um, so we wanna move into the what, but I just, I, the, the, the when part really is the foundation of what we wanted to talk about today. Um, but the what part is where we're gonna really get the meat of, of today's content. Um, and this is, again, this is, um, we've put a lot of research in it, into this subject. We really think that we've found something that is able to help these individuals transition successfully. Heidi is gonna come up and she's gonna share a lot of information about some strategies, some materials that we've used, and, and hopefully, get you to a place that you're at least familiar with it by the time you walk out today. Um, and we will be more than happy to provide more materials to you if you wanna learn more about it. Um, so that at, um, at that then, I guess I'm gonna hand it over to Heidi. Um, and, and I guess maybe I should give a quick, a quick summary of what she's going to be coming up to talk to you guys, to start today's um, material off with, is she's gonna tell you a little bit about the life course tools. Um, I know that there, there might have been a handful of sessions um, over today and tomorrow talking about life course, so she's not gonna to get too much into it. Um, but Heidi is actually one of the people at the Bureau of Autism um, who, who specializes in this, who really takes the lead on it. And I was gonna share a little bit about it today, but I think that um, I would definitely be doing it an injustice. Um, so I'm gonna ask Heidi to come up and share. And then she's also gonna dive into some goal and objective information that um, I think you guys are gonna be able to relate to, but we're gonna put a twist on what it is that you guys know already and show you how you can use it in the way that we use it um, to make transitions more smoothly into adulthood. So at that, if you guys don't mind um, bearing with us while we transition these mics, and then I'll bring Heidi up. Can I ask a quick question? So the special conditions, is that like, like what's under that? Oh, the, spe the special populations? Oh, okay. I mean, 
Yeah. Sure. So um, that can be, there's a lot of things that can fall under it. There's, there is a lot of things that can fall under it. Um, and right now, we actually, um, actually, Heidi, do you, do you want to review that sure. quick? Because you're actually sure. in charge of a you little know, bit I'm under that, too. Like, I was just um, kind of curious because I work with kind of all the population. Can, yeah. can you remember that for yeah. the end? Yeah. And Because that kind of gets a little okay. no, out there. No, um, but we definitely want to make sure that we answer that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I don't remember there's that no was actually smooth way to do this, guys. I apologize. Sorry. Can you hear me? No, no I, sh no. I shut oh, it off so it wasn't in their ears. Okay. And I don't have any pockets, so I'm not sure. This will end up falling on the floor at some point in time, and I apologize ahead of time for that. Okay. Thank you, Lindy. Um, so I'm going to start with just kind of a brief look at the um, charting the life course resources, the framework. Can, can I just see a quick show of hands so I know how in-depth to, to go on this? How many people have heard of it and know about it? So a, a good amount of you. Um, so I was really just planning to um, talk a little bit about what that means within ODP and how we've been using it and adopting it so far, and then just do a highlight of the principles. Uh, so some of this is probably going to be review for most of you, it sounds like. Um, but Pennsylvania, if, if you are aware of this or not, you may not be. Um, but Pennsylvania has been part of the national community of practice since 2016. And within Pennsylvania, at this point in time, we have almost every county uh, within the state that is participating in part of a regional collaborative. Um, and within the regional collaboratives, what they're doing is uh, trying to figure out ways within their region or their counties to support the needs of the family members within their, their particular region. And um, every single one of the regional collaboratives is using the Charting the Life course framework within the work that they're doing. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to touch on this. ODP has um, kind of, we're adopting this um, and um, we're feeling strongly that this is a, a great model and it's something that we really wanna be using within the work that we're doing. So um, just really quick review of some of the principles. Obviously the, um, the diagram that you see here um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with it, you may know that everything on this wheel, so to speak, um, encompasses the principles, and it, it really just describes what the principles are. Um, so you have the person in the center, because the, it's a very person-centered type of model, and you always have to identify the person in the center and everything um, that we're doing in looking at how we're supporting this person, they have to be central in, in determining how they're going to be supported. And then um, we have the family that surrounds them because the family is going to be a very important and a key component to doing that. Um, and then the next ring around that is actually our life domains. So when you consider um, the different areas within our life where we need to be supported. This is kind of the where, um, with community living, safety and security, with uh, just having a meaningful day and, and not doing things that we find to be important. So this could be employment, um, and then also healthy living, uh, and the social spirituality, and the citizenship and advocacy. These are just a, different areas where we see uh, needs for supports within a person's life. Um, and then again, as, as Lindy had pointed out, again, this is all about the life stages. So people need to be supported throughout the lifespan, not just once they hit a transitional age, but even from uh, the prenatal age, the whole way up through aging and up until the time of death. So we need to be considering how we're supporting people at different stages because um, even when you look at somebody who's aging, if they're using their family as supports, their family is also aging. And their family is also um, adapting maybe the things that they're doing to support themselves. So how they're supporting their, uh, their loved ones also changes over the lifespan. So 
you almost constantly have to be revisiting the supports that you have in your life and how you're using those. Um, and then this is more of um, the what. So we, we had the life domains, which is the where in our life we need support. This is the what are we doing to support? What kind of support does someone need? So um, we have them in three different buckets when using the, the life course uh, framework. So there's the discovery and navigation bucket, which really is looking at more knowledge base information. Um, so when you're talking about someone who's transitioning, it might be um, you're first learning about a diagnosis that this person has. So now you need some understanding, some knowledge about the diagnosis. Um, it could also be as you're transitioning from school age into adulthood, you're going into a completely different system now. So it might be knowledge and understanding of what the adult system looks like, because it can be very different than the child system. Um, and then also maybe even just how to navigate that system, because sometimes even getting into the adult system can be, it can feel like a lot of red tape, a lot of challenges. Um, the second bucket would be um, the connection and partnership. So this is who, what relationships you have, uh, where, um, where you're connected to your community. This could be um, support groups or self-advocacy groups, different things that you're involved with in the community. And sometimes you just need to become more connected. So if you just learn of a new diagnosis, you may want to be connected with other people who have that so that you can understand how they navigated the system that they're moving into. Um, and then the third bucket is goods and services. So this, this is things like um, sometimes actually more eligibility specific type things. Uh, so it could be like housing services, it could be mental health services, it could be autism services, it could be whatever type of goods and services you might need. Uh, so that all falls into that bucket. And really, um, if we're looking at how we're fully supporting people, we need to have all their buckets filled. And as they get older and as they have new transitions, they might need more information, they might need more connections, they might need more relationships. So we're just constantly filling these buckets through each transition all the way through life. Um, so that's really the what we need the support with and this is, this is more the how. Um, so this is actually one of the tools that you will see in the, the life course tools and um, this is called the Integrated Support Star. So it looks at how we are supporting people um, in their day-to-day -day life, or you can look at how you're supporting somebody in reaching or attaining a certain goal um, or developing a certain skill. So when you're filling out this paperwork, you really want to be doing it with the person. Um, you don't want to be doing it for the person because they need to have a say in, in what their support system is going to look like. Um, but the whole premise of this is, if you can see, there's different categories of how we support people, how we are supported. And the bottom right-hand corner is that eligibility-specific support. So this would be um, the paid services that they receive. And it's really only one-fifth of the way that we want to look at supporting somebody. Um, initially, or historically, when we talked about supporting people with developmental disabilities or any type of disability, somebody with autism, a lot of times it went back to, we're supporting them in the disability system. But this changes the way that we look at that because um, we, we don't want people to rely on those paid supports. We want to help people to learn to become more independent. And this is what will help them do that when they can identify those other supports that are available. So with whatever we're supporting them with, whether it's just in general in life, or if they want to um, transition out of school into a career or to start employment, um, we could mark that in the middle in that middle star there, and we really know what we're focusing on trying to support them with, and then we can build those supports around it specific to whatever we're identifying. So let's say we have someone who wants to join the workforce. They want to become employed. We might say um, some of their personal strengths and assets that would help them 
become employed. And those could be things that could actually help them um, guide their direction of where, what they would do for work. Um, but what would support them? What do they already have within them, their strengths, their assets that they bring? Uh, and then we look at relationships. Who do they know who could help them with that? Who do they know who they're connected with that might even be able to help them find a job or help them in recognizing what type of job they would like to do? Um, what technology might they use? Uh, and then any community-based linkages that they have? Are they involved in any organizations? Is there anything that they're already doing? Uh, within the community where it could be a job opportunity. So that's one example of a way that we would use this tool to really figure out how we're supporting people. And it, it's very helpful for, for people to be able to recognize like, my cell phone actually is a way that I get, I am supported every day. I look at my calendar every day. If I, ha if I didn't have my cell phone, I would probably be lost. That's actually a piece of technology that supports me every day, you know, and so how can we use the same things that are supporting us and identify how we can support others? Um, and then again, eligibility specific, there might be job services, but that's only one tiny part of the way that this person's being supported in employment. Um, so I wanted to share that. And then as we're talking about transition here, this is another tool that is really great, I think, for understanding how we can look at transition. So again, uh, this, is, this is a life course tool and it is called the Life Trajectory Worksheet. And in the top right corner, you start by sitting down with somebody and you look at what their vision for their good life would be. What do they want in their life? And that's what they identify um, and then they also identify what they don't want in their life. So they might say, I want to go to college, okay? And then I don't want to work at McDonald's and live at my parents' home for the rest of my life. So then we have the arrows that point in both of those directions. And we can, on those arrows, write in what, what has happened in this person's life already, what have they been doing to, to work toward their vision for a good life. And this could even be something as simple. I know Lindy had talked about, we need to start young. So when you think about employment, you typically don't think about toddlers. But if you're looking at it as we're starting young, what do toddlers do that, what do we do as parents with our toddlers that'll help them someday be successful at, at a job? Do we have them clean up their own toys? You know, do we have them help with chores at home? Uh, do, we, do we build different skills, maybe some social skills as they get a little bit older, like those elementary years? Those are all things that can help them and skills that can help them as they move toward a vision to be employed someday. Because you need all of those foundational skills if you're going to be moving in that direction. So this is something that they can, they can list what they've done already and then maybe some skills that they don't have yet that they need to continue to work on so that they can achieve what they would want in their life. Um, and so as we're looking at, at this, I know today we're talking about building skills, um, good goals, and um, we can use a tool like this to help guide us in choosing possibly the skills that somebody would want to develop so that they can meet their vision for their future. But these tools don't necessarily um, have instruction to them. They don't have any best practices for instruction. They don't necessarily measure outcomes. So that's some of the things that I'm also going to be talking about that we need to incorporate if we're going to be um, ensuring that people are able to achieve the goals that they have. Um, so just to kind of wrap up the life course, there are an incredible amount of tools. A lot of them are for transition. They even have um, workbooks that are really just focused on transition. Um, and there are so many other tools and resources that are available and there, you can download them for free off of the website. Yes.
Okay, so the question is, because I'm supposed to repeat this, um, are there any tools that are available for a nonverbal student? And specifically, I don't think that there are, but any of these can be adapted in any way. Um, and if it's somebody that you're working with closely, it's likely that you are able to communicate with them in some way and you're able to help them fill this out or at least help them identify what they want for their future so that you can work toward that. Um, so even if they are nonverbal, you can still use these tools. Um, actually, one of the questions earlier is what is special populations and how does that fall within our bureau? Um, we have a focus right now on deaf and hard of hearing and um, some of these tools don't necessarily translate quite as or transliterate quite as well right now for that population but we're also looking at how can we adapt these in any way to be more um, more beneficial for that and useful for that population as well so these tools can be adapted just to to fit the needs of whoever it is that you're trying to use them with so i hope that answers your question Okay, so I wanna shift gears now um, to the goals and objectives. I know we, I talked a little bit about how to use the life course tools to um, possibly help identify some of the skills that you would need to fit the vision that this person has for their future. Uh, but again, we need to make sure that we have really good quality goals and objectives in place so that we can ensure that we're um, making progress with uh, the people that we're supporting. Because obviously, and going back to this slide here, um, if we're gonna be transitioning people successfully, we need to make sure that we're teaching the right skills. So the skills that would be attainable for that person, we need to also make sure that we're um, teaching them with proper instruction so that they're able to uh, be successful with them and we need to be building on those skills from the time that they're young as they grow older so that it's not like all of a sudden now you need to have the skill you don't have any foundation for it but here let's go and do it you know we need to start little at a young age so that we can continue to build so in order to ensure that goals are really um, quality goals and objectives, we need to have these different components in it. They need to be specific, they need to be measurable, attainable, they need to be relevant to the person, and they need to be time bound. There needs to be some kind of time limit on those. And I'm gonna walk through these a little bit more. Um, but when we say specific, we're really talking about the who, what, when, where, why, and the which. Um, and this is of the goal. So a specific goal, when it's, when it's very clear and detailed, it has a much greater chance of being achieved. And the success of the goal is influenced really by how consistently it's being used and consistently across anyone who is supporting that person with that goal. Um, the more people that are on a team supporting somebody with a goal, the more difficult it is to be consistent. So that's why it's so important to be specific when we're writing a goal so that everyone knows exactly what is being expected and how to do it. Um, and then, let me see here. We also need to make sure that it's measurable and observable. Um, if it's not measurable, if it's not observable, we're not gonna be able to collect data on it. We're not gonna be able to monitor for progress. So by um, observable, we need to be able to make sure that when we see it happen, we can say yes or no, they performed that skill. Um, and really anybody who sees it needs to be able to recognize it. Um, so we're, we need to establish a concrete criteria for measuring uh, the progress of a goal and what our expectations are for the progress of that goal. And there needs to be a definition of how, we, how and when we are going to be measuring that progress. Um, so this is the measurable and observable part and we need to be sure that, we're, um, that when we're doing this, everybody on the team is trained to how to use it. 
uh, the next component is it needs to be attainable. Um, initially, we need to make sure that we're doing assessments so that we can, we can determine the baseline for the person. Um, how well are they at doing the skill right off, right off the bat? If we can't determine what their, their baseline is, then we may end up setting goals that are way too high, goals that aren't high enough. Um, so once we have their, their baseline and a good understanding of what their baseline is, we can understand a better way to make a goal that's attainable to them. And it's important to have those attainable goals so that we're not um, discouraging to the person. If they continue to work and work and work and we've set the bar way too high, they're gonna possibly wanna give up they may be completely discouraged. Um, so we want, to, we want goals to be challenging, but we want them to be attainable, even if we're doing it in like tiny increments, just so that they can feel some of that success and continue to have the motivation to, to keep going. What are some of the assessments that you use for that? Um, so one of the things that we do, and I'm gonna talk about this later okay. on too, um, but if we're looking at a particular skill uh, and, and we know what we want them to be able to do, we might challenge them to try it. And as we're, as we're challenging them to try it, we're collecting data on it. So we're seeing where they fall. Yes, so they can, and, and like I said, I'll, I'll go over this a little bit more of how we did this within our bureau. Um, also, they need to be relevant and they need to, um, they need to be functional and they need to be meaningful for the person. If the person doesn't want to work on it, they're not going to. So if it's not meaningful to them, they're not going to worry about even trying. Um, so, I mean, this one's kind of a given. Um, we just need to make sure that it's meaningful because then they're going to be ultimately more successful with it. And then time bound, really we just need to have timelines set for goals. If we don't have a timeline, if I don't set deadlines for myself, a lot of times it will never happen or it'll take me forever to do it because I'll just keep pushing it back and pushing it back. So we need to have a, a very concrete timeline of how we are supporting somebody in achieving goals and what our expectations are throughout this timeline so that we can determine um, if we're on the set schedule, if we're on track, uh, for the rate of the success that we're hoping to achieve. Okay, so having quality goals is the first step. And I know you probably have all at one point in time developed goals. Uh, you've probably used a lot of these same strategies that, that I just went over. Um, but that's just the first step. So we have a good quality goal. Um, and they're specific, they're measurable, they're relevant, they're observable, uh, they're attain attainable. Um, but now we need to implement them in a very strategic way to ensure that we are continuing and making progress and that they're maintaining the progress that they made. So at, at BAS, um, we developed a new service a couple years ago, and um, the new service was specifically designed for uh, building skills. We called it our skill building systematic skill building service. And um, again, this goes back to what Lindy had said earlier, where we strongly believe that everybody continues to learn throughout their life. And we strongly believe that people can become more and more independent, and there's no cliff for that. So you don't reach your cliff of being independent and now you're done. You can't become any more independent. You can't learn any more skills from that point on. You continue that throughout your whole life. Um, so we developed this. This is our skill building plan that goes along with our skill building service. And again, this might look a little bit complicated in ways, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down. Um, to have really good instruction, you don't necessarily need to follow this exact template. This is just what we created um, because we wanted to make sure that our skill building plan um, used all the best instructional strategies, so we built them into this. Um, and then it, it BA at, I'm going to say BAS, but 
sorry for that, at um, the Bureau of Services for Autism, Supports for Autism and Special Populations. I'm gonna get that wrong too, sorry. It's been two weeks with our new name. Um, but within our bureau, we, we create a different skill building plan for every single skill and every goal that a person has. Um, and you'll see why, because the instruction is gonna be different depending on what skill you're working on and how, how you're working on it. Um, so this is, this is the first page of it. And um, let me see here, I'm gonna go through this a little bit more, but you'll see in the beginning at the very top, it's just demographics. And then we have our goal and objective and there are multiple different parts that we put into our objective. Um, there's actually three different parts that we have, um, and I'm going to walk through these and, and tell you how we, how we look to, to have these written, um, because I think that that's a, an important part of what makes our objectives the way that they are. So our goals are written on an annual basis. Um, the expectation is that the person will meet the goal by the end of the year, uh, and then the objective um, is broken down into these three components, the condition, the behavior, and the criteria. And the condition is just really when and where we're expecting the person to perform this skill or this behavior. Um, and then the behavior of the skill is really what's expected of the person. So what are we expecting them to do? And then the criteria is really how we're measuring that. So how often are we expecting them to do that? Um, how long are we expecting them to do it? And are we expecting them to do it independently or are they able to use prompts? Um, so what are we expecting um, that we're gonna be measuring to determine if skill has been met? So starting with the condition, uh, the first component, again, this is the when and where. Um, and we are really looking for something natural. So something naturally that occurs that is gonna prompt or trigger this person to perform the skill. We don't like to see uh, when with staff because staff, we don't want staff to be in this person's life forever. Uh, we want this person to be able to do this independently eventually. So we want something in their natural environment that is going to prompt them to perform the behavior. Um, and ultimately, we like to see goals, again, that promote the learning, promote the progress toward independence. So we need to make sure that our goals are written in that way. And um, that's why we use the most natural prompts. But that's our condition. So these are just a couple examples and non-examples to make it a little bit easier to see. And um, some of our good examples here, like when entering a supermarket with a grocery list. You can probably almost imagine what skill this person is working on, but we don't wanna say when working with staff every Wednesday. You might go every Wednesday with the to the grocery store with your staff and you're working on learning how to, to purchase items on a grocery list, but that's not what we want to have prompt this person. We want them to be prompted to do that when they enter the grocery store with their list. So next is uh, the second component of our goals and objectives is the clearly defined behavior. And again, this needs to be very clear. It needs to be observable and measurable. We need to be able to see what's happening. Um, we want anyone who comes in and picks up this skill building plan to be able to read it and know exactly how to support that person with it. So if it's not clear, if there's some things that are implied, then this person who's coming in may not know exactly how, how to support that person. Um, so it needs to state exactly what the person's expected to do and um, not what staff is expected to do. So we don't say that staff will help them do this. We say the person will do this. Um, and we don't want any room for interpretation. So clearly defined behavior of, or the skill of what we're expecting. And then again, just a couple examples and non-examples. So I know there's a lot on here. I'm not gonna read through all of them, but really you'll, you'll see that the examples, um, you can almost picture a person doing these when you read these examples. The non-examples, which are things like, um, 
Rich will understand the rules of the game. How do we know? How do you see somebody and know what they're thinking and know what, what's going through their mind? We don't know if he understands the rule of a game just by looking at him. We have to see him do something. So for that one, it might be um, instead of that non-example, it might be when, when Rich plays a game using or following the rules of the game. So now we can see he's playing that game. He's following the rules. He's performing the skill of, of what someone was trying to get at by saying understanding, but now we can see it. So these are just some examples and non-examples. And then the third component of our objective is the performance criteria. So this is what tells, um, what tells us how well we expect the person to perform this skill in order for us to determine that they have met mastery of that skill. Um, Again, how often do we expect them to perform the skill? If it's something like cooking a meal, we might expect them to initially perform the skill, um, I mean, depending on their, their skill level, might be a couple times a week. We're expecting them to do that. Laundry, we might expe expect them to do it maybe twice a week. Um, but how often do we expect them to perform the skill? And then do we ex are we requiring any prompting? So if they have never done this skill before, they might require some prompting from staff to be able to do it. Um, but ultimately, we want to get them to the point by the end of the year that they're less prompt dependent and that they're able to do this a little bit more on their own. So if we're look, looking at um, the person using prompts, we also need to look at what type of prompt um, they, we might be offering to them. and then we also absolutely need to make sure that we're looking at the duration. Um, how long are we expecting this person to perform this skill before we say they got it, right? So if we want someone to learn how to do laundry twice a week, that first week they may be able to do it twice a week, but then they don't do it for four more weeks after that. So we might say we want somebody to be able to do their laundry twice a week for eight consecutive weeks. After eight weeks, we might say, okay, they've got this. And then we might move to a different stage of, they know how to do laundry, let's figure out how to make that um, a ma in a maintenance mode. So that's our criteria. Some examples and non-examples, again, the examples you'll see, it'll say if there's prompting, what type, the frequency that we're expecting them to perform it, and then the duration. Um, Non-examples would be 80% of the time. Well, what does that mean? The first time they do it, they might, you know, or the first week they do it, it might have been 80% of the time, might have been 100% of the time, but can they maintain that? So we need to see all of that within the criteria. When he feels like doing it, well, that doesn't tell us anything. So those are some non-examples. And this is, this is something that we developed for our providers. It's just a guidance of, it's like a cheat sheet, we call it, of the goals and objectives. So it tells, it describes what it is, it defines each of the, the components, and it gives examples of those. Okay, so we talked about the when, uh, what we use, and now we're gonna talk about how to do it. Um, so how do we actually work on skill building in our world um, with our adults with autism in our programs? Um, I showed you the first half of our skill building plan, which just had the, the um, demographics and then the goal. Uh, now I'm gonna show you the second half, which really is the instructional strategies portion of the plan. This is the meat or the bulk of the plan, and it looks kind of complicated right now. Um, but there's a lot of different things on here, and remember, these are strategies that we're gonna be using for the full year to help that person achieve the goal by the end of the year. Um, and these are based off of best instructional strategies and best practices. Um, so these are things that we felt very necessary to include in our skill building plan. Um, we start with looking at the setting. So, each of these 
rows here is a different setting. One of them is at home, one is the community. We may have a skill that we're working on just at home. We may have a skill that we're working on at home and in the community, so you can complete those. Um, the instructional strategies may look different depending where you're teaching this skill. So that's why we have those separated out. Um, and then, like we said before, we, we need to make sure that we understand the baseline for this person. So where are they starting at? What can they do? If we're talking about laundry, do they know, um, do they know how to sort clothes? Do they know how many clothes to put into the washer? Do they know how much soap to put in? So we need to see what level they're starting at um, so that we can make sure that we're building these instructional strategies around their current skill levels. Um, so we need, we need to know their baseline. We also need to know um, the natural cue. So this kind of goes back to our condition statement from our objective. What naturally is gonna trigger this person to do it? We include that right in here. Uh, materials and environmental arrangements. So it could be this person is not so great at shopping, so they may not know what soap to buy or what detergent to buy, fabric softener. They may not even think about fabric softener. So there may be some things that we need to do ahead of time um, just to set them up while they're building this skill. So if they're doing laundry, we may need to make sure that we're shopping, we're buying the stuff, we're putting it right by the washing machine so they have it there or if they have to go to the laundromat, making sure that they have quarters ahead of time. Um, so there might be some things that we need to do. It might be that they need a task analysis. So we might need to have that taped to the outside of the washing machine so that they, they can refer to that for what steps they need to take in order to complete the, the laundry. Um, So with our best instructional strategies, these are some things that, that we're including here. Um, prompting, like I said, we need to make sure that we are clearly defining what types of prompts so that anyone supporting them who is going to be offering prompts is doing it in a very consistent way. Um, so we need to make sure that there's a data collection tool so that we're able to monitor progress and um, that we're offering reinforcement error correction, what do we do if they make a mistake, and then that we're in ultimately gen allowing them to generalize to other situations, other settings, and then uh, toward maintenance. So I'm going to walk through each of these a little bit more in depth. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you consider, so when you're talking about task analysis, like a list of or, you know, steps of how to do mm -hmm. do you consider that to be like a type of prompting then? It can be, yes. Um, it can be what we, what we refer to as a permanent prompt. So something that is there um, that they can refer to at any point in time. So it, yes, it could be. Um, but it's also a way that they can, and I'll get into this too, they can self-monitor what they're doing um, and we're tracking the progress with it too. Um, so different types of prompts here and I think I even have this down at the bottom, um, of the instructor prompts. But we have natural prompts, and then there's instructor prompts. So natural prompts could be when you're going to the grocery store and the cashier says, that'll be 525. OK, so now you know that's my prompt. I got to get my money out, right? So that's a natural prompt. Um, I'm doing laundry. I don't have any underwear left. OK, I got to do some laundry. That's a pretty good prompt, right? Um, those are natural prompts. Instructor prompts, um, we have gesture prompts. So if somebody, if you're working with somebody to perform a skill and they forget the soap, you might just say, like, point to it. And that is a very um, least restrictive type prompt. So a not very intrusive prompt. Just like a gesture. Then there's an indirect verbal prompt. So it could be, um, I think you forgot a step. What step did you forget? Or what, what else do we need to do? Um, and then there's a direct verbal prompt, which could be, let's put some soap in. Um, model prompt would be if you're doing it for them and they're watching you do it. And then the physical prompt, obviously, would be you're physically helping them to do what the skill is. 
Um, so these start at, um, and then the permanent prompt could be that task analysis, could be pictures, uh, something that's just there permanently that they can refer to. And we, we like to start with the least restrictive prompts and then move toward more restrictive prompts. There's also times when it's better to start at the most restrictive prompts and move the other direction toward least restrictive prompts. I mean, think about a skill of learning how to cross the street. You're not gonna say, <laughs> when you're saying there's a car. No, you're gonna probably use a physical prompt to stop someone if they're ready to jump out in front of a car. So if safety is involved, you always start at the most restrictive or the most intrusive prompt and work your way backwards. Um, and I, I guess I kind of talked about this a little bit. So um, common prompting systems, we need to look at are we moving from the least to most intrusive or vice versa? And time delay. So if I'm offering a prompt, how long do I wait before the next prompt? So if they forget to put the soap in the laundry and I point to it and they're still not doing it, how long do I need to give them before I use maybe um, an indirect verbal prompt? And if they still don't respond to that, how long do I wait before, is it 30 seconds? Is it five seconds? It's all gonna depend on what skill you're building, again, the safety components that are involved in it, um, and do you do it constant? So every 30 seconds you offer the next prompt, or is it progressive? You change the time intervals in between each prompt. Um, but no matter how you do it, you need to make sure that it's, it's written clearly in the plan so everyone's doing it the same way. And then data collection, this is a, an extremely important, important part of it um, because we need to make sure that whatever data we're collecting, we're using that to drive the decisions moving forward with our instruction. Um, when using applied behavioral analysis, we need to make sure that we're doing this. We're driving our um, decisions to make strategies moving forward um, so that we're using the data to do, to do that. Um, the data is going to help us determine if the, if the goal has been mastered. It's going to help us determine if we're making progress. It's going to help us determine if we need to change some things because it doesn't seem to be working. Um, and it's going to help us learn whether or not our teaching strategies are effective. Um, so it's really important to make sure that we're developing a data collection sheet that is collecting the correct information for whatever goal we're trying to achieve. So we have five W's of data collection, which is really the who, the what, the when, and the where. And we need to know um, who's going to be collecting data, because whatever data collection sheet we develop or we use has to be user friendly for the person who's going to be collecting data. If it's so complex that they don't understand it, we're not getting good data. We're not getting probably any data. Um, and then we need to look at what. So are they going to be collecting on the frequency that somebody is doing something? Are they going to be co um, collecting data on the duration? So how long does it take somebody to do a skill? Um, what are they collecting data on? Uh, where are they collecting data? So where is the skill going to be taught? Um, when? Are we going to have them collect data every day, every couple hours, once a month? Um, so how often are we expecting them to collect data? Um, and then also just the importance of data is it's going to show us that progress or that lack of progress. Uh, so I have a couple different types of data collection here. This is just a task analysis. And one thing that we tell people when you're developing a task analysis to help somebody in working with a skill, make sure that you put the instructions on how to collect data on the, on the actual task analysis sheet. So again, everyone knows how to collect that data, how to mark it down. If you are using a coding system of, every t of any kind, make sure you include a legend at the top so that everyone knows what PT stands for um, or what whatever the code is. 
And again, this can be something that can be great for somebody who is trying to use self-monitoring. Or it can be something for anybody else who's helping to collect data, but it has to just be user-friendly. So this is another example, and this is um, a data collection sheet that's just looking at the frequency of a behavior. So how often is it occurring? I think this one has um, mark an X every time you see the behavior occur. And no matter what you're tracking, just make sure that you're tracking it for the goal that you have and the criteria that you set for your goal because um, you wanna make sure that it aligns with what you're doing. So another instructional strategy is using reinforcement, which is really just um, the positive response to a desi desired behavior. Um, and we need to make sure that whatever reinforcement we're using is meaningful to the person. I've tried that with my kids before and I've said, you're not gonna get this if you don't, or whatever, you know, and they're like, I don't care. Send me to my room if I get in trouble, I don't care. So it has to be meaningful. You know, if it's not meaningful, they're not gonna be working toward it. Um, it needs to be offered often and immediately when you're first developing a skill. And then you wanna start to fade that out over time. So you don't want them to become reliant on this reinforcement or just motivated only by the reinforcer. Um, but we really just want to make sure that it's something that's guiding um, what we're doing. And then, of course, we have error correction. So if somebody does not complete the skill the way that it's expected, what are we doing? How are we responding to them so that they know that they are not performing it correctly and they need to make some changes? So again, I think I, I mentioned earlier, if somebody forgets to put the, the soap in, the, the washing machine, you know, how are we responding? Are we just pointing to it? Are we gonna make a comment? And everyone should be doing this the same way. So once we have um, felt like the person has been able to attain the skill, how do we generalize that and um, help them maintain that? So oftentimes people with autism have some difficulties with generalizing. And um, I have a story where um, I shared this earlier with Lindy, but I'm the one in my house who does laundry. And I can, I do so much laundry, probably, probably a lot of moms out here know this, but um, we went on vacation recently and I had to do laundry while I was on vacation, so I had to go to the laundromat. And I walk in and I'm like, I don't quite know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't know how much money these machines, how much does this cost? You know, can I swipe my credit card? Do I have to use quarters? Where does the soap go? There's not even a space for, for fabric softener. So how do I do this? You know, it's, skills seem to be very different depending on where you're learning them. So that's why we wanna use, when we're teaching a skill, the most natural setting where they're gonna be performing this skill. But once you've got it down in that setting, you go to a different, washing machine and it is completely different. Now lucky for me, this laundromat had task analysis all over. So on the wall there's a sign and it says make sure you put your money in first, turn it on, put the soap in and then put your clothes in and you know so it's telling me what to do. So I had that prompt right there which told me exactly what to do. But sometimes we need a little assistance with generalizing the skill that we learn to a different setting. Um, and then we, we need to make sure that we're doing maybe some self-monitoring or something to help maintain that skill over time. Uh, because if skills are not practiced, we lose them. And I think I talked ahead without turning that. Okay, so this is another thing that we developed um, within our bureau in 2014, we were gathering data on the goals that our providers had developed for the participants in our waivers. And um, from this data, we were looking to see if the goals were actually measuring the progress and um, if you could actually see if there was progress made, if there was no change, um, or if there was actual regression. And of the, the data that we collected, 
embarrassingly, only 25% of the goals that we reviewed had any kind of measurable information. Um, so we thought, okay, we need to do something different. So we searched around and we found this model. So this is called the goal attainment um, scale. And we have built this right into our skill building plan. And almost all of our services now uh, within our bureau are required to complete one of these for every single goal. And really what this does is it helps to track the progress. It's, it's really an amazing model. I don't, has anyone seen this before? No? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to walk through it just so that you can see that it's not really as complicated as it looks, although the next slide I think is going to look more complicated um, as we get further. But the general steps here are you have to identify the stage of learning for the person, then you create the chart, and then um, you implement it, and as you're implementing it, you're determining um, the level that they're attaining this goal. So how much progress are they making on the goal? And we do call it GAS, we don't call it GAS, but we, we had to shorten it somehow because goal attainment scaling is just very long. Um, but when we're looking at the stages of learning, there's three different stages here. So there's skill acquisition for someone who is just learning a new skill. They have no clue how to do it, they're learning it, or they don't they just won't do it. So this is skill acquisition. And then there's skill fluency where they can do it, they're just not very fluent with it, they're prompt dependent or they're just, um, they don't do it very accurately. And then we have that skill maintenance and generalization where they can do it, but we're not quite sure how long term they're gonna be able to do it. Um, so these are just some questions here and for the sake of time, they're just questions that you may uh, use when you're helping somebody or when you're determining the stage of learning for a person. So um, do they know when they've done the skill? Have they done it before? Here's our very complicated example of our goal attainment scale um, that we might see for one of the participants in our waiver. And um, I have some circles here to make it stand out, but at the top you have the demographics again. And then here's where we put that goal and the objective. So we have the condition spelled out, the behavior, the criteria, and then we also have their baseline. So this person who's working on laundry, um, Mary's working on laundry, she's gonna sort, wash, dry, fold, and put it away following a task analysis. So we have that task analysis. This is very clear. We know if she does it or not, we can see her doing it. Um, two times a week for 10 consecutive weeks independently. Um, currently, she does it one time a month independently, so we know that she can do it independently. So we have this skill fluency stage of learning right now that we're working on. Um, she can do it, she's just not doing it frequently enough. So we have that at the top. And then we have, as you can see here, remember our goals are set out for an entire year. So we break it down by quarters so that each quarter at the end of the quarter we're reviewing the data to determine if we're on track. That way we're not getting to the end of the year and being like, oh man, we're so far behind. Um, we know each quarter. So each column here is a separate quarter of the year. We put our baseline at the very beginning. So in, in quarter one, when we first start, that's where she is. She does it one time a month independently. And then our annual criteria, two times a week, for 10 consecutive weeks independently, we put over here in the fourth quarter. This is what we want to see happen by the end of the year. And this whole row here is what we expect to see happen at the end of each quarter. So this is where we expect her to be at the end of each quarter. And once we've finished out the quarter, we've collected the data, we can see if we're on track. Very clear, very spelled out. Now it was in the middle of this scale or of this chart because we want to leave room for somebody to do better than we're expecting. And that's what this bottom section is. This is where at the end of the quarter, if they're doing better than what we expected them to do, we want to make note of that. So that's where they would fall in that bottom section. But there's also times when you fall a little bit behind and you don't quite meet 
the expectations for that quarter. Um, now, it's very important to notice where you are at the end of the quarter because um, we use this to, de to determine where we're going to go next with instruction and with our next de um, decisions. So let's say halfway through the year, we, ha we check out Mary, and, and it's the end of the second quarter. We're seeing where she's at. This is where we expect her to be. Uh, we expect her to be doing her laundry one time per week for six weeks independently. So six weeks out of that quarter, we expect them. But this is actually where she was. She only did it for five weeks, not the six. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal. So at that point in time, we need to determine what's our next step with Mary. Um, is there something that we need to change with what we're doing? Um, is there something that uh, we're doing wrong? So that's, and this one looks a little bit different. It's not quite as complex, but this is where that bottom section comes in. So we would, for Mary, we would note her level of attainment. We would say where she is. So she's not quite where we expected her to be. Um, and we would mark that down at that quarter so that we're keeping track. We might add a comment in there, like she went on vacation one week and she didn't quite know how to use the laundromat washing machine, so she skipped it that week. And that's why she didn't have that six consecutive weeks. She only did five. So we'll add a comment in there if there's a reason why she didn't quite meet it that quarter. And then we have instructional decision down at the bottom. So that'll drive what we do next. If we know that she was on vacation that week and that's the reason she didn't meet it, we might say continue instruction as written. If she is completely behind, we might need to change the instruction that we're offering. We might need to do it a little bit differently. Uh, we might have set our goals way too high and not realized it from the start. So we might need to change our expectations a little bit so that we can make sure that she continues to make progress and that she's not too overwhelmed. So that's what, that's what we um, use to track our data. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Lindy for the last couple minutes. 10 minutes left to talk about um, the data portion of it. Can I just ask one more question? Um, so, the, so when you, when you see group programming, do you mean just, and I can't remember exactly what you change it to, but just the Bureau of Autism or all of ODP? So currently, we are using this, we are, the Bureau of Autism is the only, um, our waiver is the only one that uses, that has this particular service. We would love to see this ODP wide, um, but this is currently, the Bureau of Autism Services developed this, and we've. So all the providers, like anybody providing services under the Bureau of Autism are using this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they're for nearly, I mean all except I think ResHab, we're using the, the goal attainment scaling. There's a couple services that are not. So the, the question was, um, is is everybody in ODP using the skill building services that provided? And and so that's what Heidi was saying, that, it, that it's only provided in the Bureau of Autism Services at this point. I'll just use this. Thank you, though. Thank you for that question. Um, all right. I can squeeze this in in 10 minutes. Um, so. What Heidi was talking about is, is identifying that level of attainment because we, that's how we're going to identify if somebody um, learned the skills that we, we set to, for them to learn, right? Um, but a huge part of this is using the data from that data collection form that she was talking about in the skill building plan, um, collect all that data and, and analyze it for next steps. Because this is how data-driven instruction happens, right? This is an ongoing cycle that's going to happen. We're collecting the data, we're analyzing it, we're making the instructional decisions based off of that. Um, and this, this, is, this is the cycle of the data-driven instruction. Um, there's no guessing. There's not supposed to be guessing whenever we're putting those next steps in for strategies. And the only way that we can identify that without the guessing is through the data that we're collecting. Um, so again, this, this takes us back to this loop back in the beginning because um, the way that we're going to be able to tell that somebody is, is learning that is by identifying and analyzing that data. Uh, so 
the um, Bureau of Supports for Autism and Special Populations. Um, we go out and do audits with our providers. Uh, the clinical team just recently started doing this within the last couple years. And something that we noticed a couple years back was that they have all of this awesome data and it's sitting in filing cabinets and they're doing nothing with it. So they're collecting all this data and it's really good data forms. Um, they're customized, they're, they're um, really great basic forms, but they're just letting it sit on their desk and they're thinking they're gonna get back to it, but they never do anything with it, right? Um, but this is, this is how we need to develop our next steps is by analyzing that data and doing something with it. Um, so for, for those who might be new to um, looking at data and developing instruction, um, us at the Bureau have developed this, this infographic, and I know you can't really see it too, too well right now. This is the first part. It's called our Instructional Decisions Service Guide. It's document. And what this is, is it's meant to show people how to read a graph, um, what the graph means, and then how to make your instruction based off of the findings from the graph. So I'll give you a quick glimpse into what this actually is. Um, so as you can see here, um, the first column is about data analysis. So it's saying, okay, so you, this is what you're finding on your graph. So for example, um, if you want to see a skill increase on that first top row, and I know the, the writing's a little bit small, guys, so I apologize for that. But let's say you wanna see a skill increase. Um, you, the trend line is going to be going up on the graph, on the graph, and that means progress is being made, right? So if we want to figure out what to do for the decision, go over to the next column, and it says you don't make any changes. You're going to continue that instruction, and but if that trend line is really steep, then consider making some instruction more difficult to facilitate greater learning. So this is actually this walks you through exactly what to do, um, and and this is mainly developed for those people who are just starting to learn how to use data analysis to make those instructional decisions. Um, the bottom half of this gives an example of some graphs. What what a graph might look like if you're you're if it's showing progress what a graph might look like if it's not showing progress. So we really try to teach people how to make these instructional decisions based off of data analysis. Um, and in five minutes, I'm gonna see if I can walk you through one of our real examples. So um, this is our example for Mary, and Mary is having some um, difficult times with her coping strategies whenever she's expected to do something that she doesn't want to do. Um, so like any of us, um, you know, we don't want to wash the dishes and we might get a little huffy when it's time to do that. Okay, so Mary's battling the same thing. Um, her staff put together this pretty basic data sheet. Um, so for those of you in the back that the font's a little small, you're, we're looking at is it a, a is it a non-preferred task? Is it an unplanned task for Mary? Did she complete the task immediately after being prompted? Did she use a coping strategy? Was the task completed after the strategy was used? And did the problem behavior occur? Um, so very, very basic data sheet. Um, but what we're gonna ask is not for all these data sheets to be completed and piled up. We want you to do something with these, right? We want you to use these to inform how you're gonna move forward with your staff and what strategies you're gonna put into place. Um, so looking at this, um, this is the analyzed data for the opportunities each month. So um, the red shows the opportunities to, the, the number of opportunities Mary got to use her strategies, the green is her coping strategies, and the blues are her tasks completed. So as you can see here, Mary had an increase in the, the number of opportunities that she had to use these strategies, an increase in her coping strategies that she used, and an increase in the task completed. So we can see here that she's, she's showing progress, right? She's improving in all of these things. So then the story's not done yet because we wanna remember data tells a story. Right, because there's lots of different ways that we can chop up this data to take a look at it. This just shows us one part of that. So we wanted to dig a little bit deeper, and we thought, okay, we want to take a look at what Mary's numbers were in regards to her individual behaviors that we were looking at. Um, what we were trying to put into place is teach Mary how to communicate instead of showing physical aggression, right? So this shows um, how often th from 
June to the following August that Mary did all of these behaviors, hitting as well as yelling. And we can see by looking at this that she had a decrease in her hitting and an increase in her yelling, which is exactly what we wanted to see, right? So again, she's showing progress for these individual behaviors. Story's still not done. Um, we thought we want to see all behaviors, regardless of what, what kind they are, maybe she had some scratching, some biting, across long, the long span of time from June to the following August. So again, this isn't dividing the behaviors up by type, but this is just looking at them all over, and we're still seeing a decrease in these behaviors. So again, Mary showing progress. So these are, I'm sure there's a lot more ways we could have divvied up this data, but this is the way that we decided we were gonna tell Mary's story, um, and this is the way that the behavioral specialist decided to, to look at this data. But this just shows you an idea of um, what happens when you analyze that data and what all it can tell you. And again, um, if you're not used to being able to identify what instructional decision you do based off of that data, that's where this document comes into play. Um, really, really good resource for people who are still trying to learn this, this type of strategy. Um, so that is our when, using what, and how. Um, and again, we just, this is our take of combining um, human services with the education piece, but um, Again, we did pass around that document. Please um, put down your email if you do want us to send you a copy of the uh, perfect of the updated PowerPoint. This is um, inside the PowerPoint is our resource list, um, so you'll be able to get a copy of that, and and that's all the that's how you can get access to the documents that we use throughout the training. And then um, this is our personal emails as well as our training mailbox email. So if you have any questions in regards to trainings, if you want different trainings and resources, we're all about providing those things to you. So feel free to email us and we can get that to you. So again, we really do appreciate you um, electing to come and, and we hope that we were able to challenge you a little bit and give you something else to think about moving forward. So thank you.